Hi, I'm Ray Smith. Uh, this is the uh, video that kind of coordinates to the chapter on teaching Altissimo in my Saxophone Pedagogy book. And I'd like to just to discuss with you some ideas about helping students gain some facility with the Altissimo. So first of all, I've got to say that uh, preparatory to any Altissimo playing is always the overtone series. Every book that I know has been published on this starts with doing the overtone series so that we learn how to use our embouchure. Jog's got to push forward, a little more pressure. Uh, that's to get us in the neighborhood, but all the fine tuning is done in the th throat with the tongue, oral cavity adjustments. And uh, a lot of stomach has to be involved in this, a lot of breast support. And those are things that, of course, have to be taught. Uh, the other thing I think that needs to be taught, of course, is the fingerings because <clears throat> Most students seem to obtain altissimo fingerings in kind of a random helter-skelter way. Uh, and there are different flows. Like I can, for each part of the altissimo, like say we take the range from uh, E up to A, there is more than one flow to get there. There can be two, even three flows. In other words, fingerings, I call them flows. They're, they're fingerings that flow together so that you can actually get some facility through that part. I think a lot of students will find a fingering from flow three, for example, for this note. Uh, it happens because they saw it on an internet tutorial or something. And then they, they find something for the next note from a master class they attended. And then they see something else from watching a YouTube performance. And they say, oh, it looks like he's using that. And they get these fingerings and really random ways so that we're going from flow three to flow two to flow three to flow one to flow two and nothing's flowing. And so I think we've got to get the students a, a message that they need fingerings that flow together so they can have some facility. So number one, that hardest part of the altissimo is, and this is what I call phase one to learn the altissimo, is that part that goes from high E up to high A. And so here's a little exercise that I use. Now I'm fingering a G, then an A, then an A sharp, regular fingerings. Then I'm fingering a B flat. <laughs> All right, so A sharp and B flat are the same note. However, I'm fingering A sharp with the side key B flat. And then I'm fingering uh, B flat with the one and one. B flat with the side B flat key added. And actually the side B flat key functions like an uh, like a resonator key, kind of like the little E flat finger on the altissimo notes of the clarinet. The side B flat performs that function for the for the several notes just off the horn here. And so once it goes down for the A sharp, then it stays down for the B flat, which I'm playing one and one, and then also for the B. I'm keep I'm leaving the side B flat key down. Now that's, that's giving me sort of a quarter tone distance then between the A sharp and the B flat. Of course, I'm preparing fingerings here for when we're playing high, and I'll have the student get it low first like that. Okay, put the octave key on, same fingering. Okay, now put your finger, your index finger, up on that front F key. This is the key above your first normal first finger key. We call it the front F. I'm playing the same fingerings, but now my finger's up on that front F, which gives me an additional octave key. Of course, what this does is it gives me E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, in a very facile way. So, I think this is a good way to get started. Now, let me illustrate something here. The uh, front F key is designed to open less than if you just press the F key. Why? Because we're making a note hole here, which is quite large, double as an octave key hole, which should be very small. Well, sometimes students, they can get that front E and F, and sometimes F sharp, but the G and the G sharp are very difficult to get. And that really comes down 
to having this octave key act more like an octave key where it's really close to the instrument. So I'm going to I'm going to put a match stick in there so that it's really opening very, very little. Now, I can't test the front F key or it'll make the match stick fall out. But I'm leaving the match key stick there. Uh, the other thing that's going to do is ruin the front E. So I'm just going to start on F. <clears throat> and a lot of times I'll even have them leave the thumb off because we don't need that much more octave key. We're just using the smallest amount of octave key from the F key that we can. Just with, with no thumb. And the students would be blown away by how much they can, how much easier they can get those notes, just because the octave key is working better. This can sometimes be adjusted on the alto. It would need the help of a repairman. It can be done on the tenor by hand, but uh, the alto is a little too hard to bend by hand. But it, there is an adjustment screw there. But frankly, it's not adequate. The only horn where I think it actually does something is on the on the Yamaha uh, Custom, not the Z, but the other horns, uh, the EX. Uh, has a better adjustment there because of Eugene Rousseau who suggested it. Um, once I get the feel of it, I don't really need to worry about that, but I should I should illustrate. I'll put that matchstick back in so I can illustrate how that ruins the front E. Oh, no. I touched the front F key and made the match fall out. Let's try this again. Okay, so I'm not going to touch the front F key this time. And I'm going to come from the F down to the E. It ruins the E. Now I can get the E back with the G sharp key. Perhaps it should have been that way from the first, but I don't think we're going to win that with the saxophone world at this point. Uh, when you think about it logically, there's a problem here because G to A is a whole step. And then we put our front F key on and now E to F is a half step. What's wrong with that picture? If I finger G sharp to A and that gets me E to F, that makes a whole lot more sense because we're overblowing six up here. Uh, and maybe it should have been that way. So there are two philosophies on how to adjust this front F key. I can adjust it really down close like that, which will sacrifice the E and it'll help everything else. And then I can put the G-sharp key on for the front E and bring it back, although it's a little bit sharp. I uh, have to learn to kind of blow it down. Uh, the, other adjust, the other philosophy would be to adjust that as close as I can without actually sacrificing the E. So I can still play it as if it was a G instead of a G-sharp. That's a little trick I used to get that started. Once the student gets a feel for this, then this is, these, these issues of the octave key and so on are a little less critical. And a lot, the whole world is kind of blown past that, but that's uh, the reality of the situation. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, the first assignment I would give a student then once they get that going is to learn to play these notes as big as a house. Sharp's the smallest target. It's a hard one. But it's worth the effort because it gives so much facility. Uh, so that's what I would do. Once the student's getting some facility with that, and, I, and I'll have them go up to A. I finger A, two, three, four, five, six. It's just like a D minus the first finger. Uh, it's the most powerful. On the alto, it's a bit sharp. It's a pretty good note on tenor. Uh, a little sharp on the alto. And so I will... Um, I, I will uh, have them go up to A. Uh, now, how do we get higher than A? And this is where we have to go to the phase two of learning over break materials, which is over the break fingerings, which is to overblow sixths from the high C sharp. So I'm going to finger high C sharp open, but I'm going to put the side B flat key on it for the resonator. And then I'm going to go up with the palm key is D, E flat, E, F, just like usual. And this is, and then I'm going to overblow the six. Now, a sixth is pretty easy to hear because you can think of uh, the NBC theme: NBC, ba da, is a major six, or my Bonnie lies over the ocean. And that'll help you get the right sound in your ear because you got to have your sound in the ear. Um, Pre-hearing the note is critical. All right, so 
I'm fingering both those notes open with the side B flat. Then I'm fingering just the D key, palm key. That's giving me D and then a high B, a sixth higher. And then I'll finger the E flat. That'll give me a high C. Gives me a high C sharp. And I'm fingering a high F and I'm getting a high D sharp. I could do that with the F sharp too and get a high D sharp. However, that's where I usually slide back over to open uh, because the second phase or the next phase uh, is to overblow a fourth above the sixth. So if I finger the open C sharp again, I can get a fourth above that. So I'm fingering open. It's giving me an A sharp and then it's giving me a D sharp. So I get that D sharp with an F sharp palm key fingering, or I get that D sharp with an open fingering. Uh, and then I can trace the palm keys right up again, overblowing a fourth above the sixth. The easiest way to hear a fourth is probably, here comes the bride. So I'm like, my bond, here comes. So I've got a up a, a sixth above the, the palm key D. That was the D fingering with the, a sixth above gives me B. And then a fourth above that's going to give me high E. And then I can trace that right up. It takes some strength to get these upper notes. And I wouldn't introduce fourths right off the, at the first. I would instead get them blowing six for a while. Give them at least a week or two or three with that. And then I could introduce playing the fourth above that. Now we've got some very facile fingerings that I can move, and I, and I believe that it's best to give the students facile fingerings first. Fingerings that I can get some flow with. Uh, then later we'll look at some longer fingerings. Uh, there are different fingerings up here, and you, sometimes you've got several fingers you can play for one note. Uh, some of the longer fingerings, of course, have more guts for the tone, more body for the tone. Some of them have better intonation. Uh, for facility, they're not good. You can't get an out of them fast enough. So the facility fingerings may not be great if you're just picking it out of thin air and bearing down on it. That high G sharp, for example. Okay, I can play that pretty strong, but it is a small target. And if I was really wailing on that, I might play it with the, a longer fingering. It's got a little bit more power, a little more ring. It's a little more solid. It's not quite so precarious. I might you know, feel like it could break at any minute. Uh, and so we do use a lot of long fingerings up here for very purposes. Uh, another example might be if I was playing a high B, that's just with the D key. By the way, in jazz, I normally add the third finger to that because it changes the octave key from the neck octave key to the body octave key. I don't usually use that with my classical mouthpiece here, but I'll show you. It does give it a little more power. To put down that third finger. It just all it does is change the octave key, and the other octave key seems to be a little bit better for the high B and the high C. And so I will add the third finger to that often. Uh, but if I was playing that, let's say at the end of the Creston concerto, I want that B to really sing. I may not play it this way. Uh, it's not quite as much body. So a shorter fingering it has a lot of facility, but for that particular purpose, I'm going to play a much longer B. I've given these long fingerings in my book. I've given all this stuff in my book. You can see all the fingerings written out in the book. So it'll, uh, you really need to look at the book and follow along with this to really understand everything I'm doing and to really get the whole gist of this. But So I'm fingering the B in that case with 2, 3, E flat key and side C. The long fingering that really has a lot of sizzle for the end of that piece, but it's not something I can play with any kind of facility. When I say facility, I want to be able to, using the fingerings that I suggested here first, let's say I'm playing a high C sharp major scale. I want to be able to have that kind of facility. And I'm using crossing over to the front F, then I'm, which is E sharp, of course, and then I'm playing F sharp. By adding the side key, then I'm playing G sharp by going to the to it looks like B, but I'm on the front F key, and then I'm playing A sharp open. So 
still have my side B flat key down on that as the resonator. And then I'm playing uh, the palm key fingerings for the high B sharp. I'm fingering like an E flat, palm key fingering E flat. And the high, I've got this written out in the book. You can look at it. But the, the high C sharp, I'm using like a high E palm key fingering. However, I often cross over to the front, especially when I'm doing jazz, I'll cross over to the front so that it's a... Right here, instead of going to the palm key fingers, I'm crossing back to some front fingers. I've got that written in the book, uh, those fingers and so on too. Uh, let's take a short break. I'll come back and talk with you a little bit more about uh, tenor and barry soprano. Okay, gave me a chance to grab my tenor. I just like to illustrate that some things change on the tenor. And so these fingerings that we just used with the G, A, B flat side key, B flat one and one with the side key, and then B with the side key, they aren't going to work right on the tenor. Unfortunately, uh, the front E and F will work. But when we hit the F sharp, everything drops just about a half step. Let me illustrate that. So if I'm playing my front E and F, and the same fingering for F sharp I used on the alto a minute ago. It's almost a half step flat. If I do it as an octave, it's not going to be up to pitch. Uh, if I do the G as an octave with the G alto fingering, or the uh, uh, G sharp with the G sharp alto fingering, these fingerings don't work on the tenor. So we have to do, deal with this a little differently. Actually, what we do, uh, and, and this is basically how the old fingerings in the uh, uh, Ted Nash High Harmonics book are formulated, uh, they, we have to adapt the alto fingerings down a half step. So if I use the G fingering from alto, but I use it for F sharp, this makes sense. It's a little sharp, so we usually end up dropping finger number two. These fingers are all written out in the book. When I bring down finger number two with that G alto fingering, it makes a really good F sharp on the tenor. It brings it down to pitch where it needs to be. A little sharp without the number two finger, because uh, it's not a perfect half step. And then if I use the G sharp fingering from alto, in other words, I'm just using the front fingering plus the side B flat key. I'm only getting, uh, I, I'm not getting G sharp, I'm getting G natural. Just like that's a narrow target on the alto, it's also a narrow target on the tenor. Although historically, this, is, this finger has been used a lot. So I could play, I was always stuck on how to get the G sharp with any facility for years. So I can get good facility here. The front E, F, then to that F sharp, which is like the G alto fingering, and then to the G, which is like the G sharp alto fingering. But then I get stuck at G sharp, because then I have to use the long fingering. So it's like. Now, the only way I know to get G sharp for quite a while is to go to the long G sharp fingering. Well, there's no facility. If I needed to go back and forth quickly, from F sharp to G sharp. It's a lot of rigmarole that's not working very well. I'm not going to get any facility out of that. Thanks to my good friend Jeff Coffin, a few years ago, he showed me a fingering that is not any good if you're trying to play a long G sharp, but it's great for the facility right here. Uh, second finger of each hand. So number two and number five. So now I can, I can make it work this way. Actually, I think that's one of the first times I've tried that on my classical mouthpiece to use that thing. I usually use that on my jazz mouthpiece. It does work. It just surprised me. So I can actually do pretty get pretty facile if I do that. So I'm basically using the old Ted Nash fingerings, but I'm not using that the the long fingering that he used for G sharp. I'm using that second finger of each hand. That works pretty well.
But then I discovered another way to do this years ago that um, has quite a bit of facility. If I play the F sharp, one, three, four, and then one, three, six for the, for the G. And then if I put down the side C key with either the F sharp fingering or the G fingering, it works quite as good facility. Get quite a bit of facility with that. Um, for example, as I'm playing an A major scale, and this A major scale is written out in the book too, but it's a great example of getting from some, from some facility because I'm, I'm going to use, and you know what, with these fingerings, this is a second, uh, second flow of fingerings for the tenor. Uh, it really doesn't matter whether I swap over to the front for the front E and F because uh, the way the fingerings are, it doesn't really facilitate anything. I could still use the palm key fingering for E. I can do it either way. Here, here would be the front E. Let's swap into the front. Not very really clean, sorry. If I use the palm key for the E, it's really better. And I can get some pretty good facility with those fingerings. So, uh, just to point out that the tenor drops a half step at the F sharp. And for F sharp, G, and G sharp, you've got to use different fingerings. And I've given two different flows here. They're all written out in the book so that you can get some really good clarity on that. But uh, uh, that's my saxophone pedagogy book. I would really recommend the book with these videos. It'll help a ton. And it's available at Amazon. Uh, here's the thing to know about the baritone. It also drops the half step that the tenor does at the F sharp. The front E and F will work, but then it drops a half step. And so the tenor fingerings actually work pretty well. You can use those um, similar fingerings to the uh, uh, to the Ted Nash fingerings, the, the first flow that I gave you. You can use those on the, uh, well, you can use the F sharp on the berry. The, the G doesn't work so well. I, I've got these things written down in the book. You can uh, study them a little bit and, and uh, come out with some really good uh, facility on the berry for the altissimo. However, uh, for the, for the uh, second flow, the one I just gave on the tenor, where I'm 1-3-4 for the F sharp to 1-3-6 for the G, and then add in the side C, or add in the side C to the F sharp, those actually work quite well on the berry as well. You can do, the, the alto fingers are not going to work there, but the tenor fingers you can adapt to the berry fairly quickly. Here's the thing to know about the berry though, it slips another half step down at the A. And so what the fingers that I use for A on the berry are really the ones I'd use for B flat on the tenor or the alto, because it slides, I didn't say this either, I should have said this, but the, from the A up, the alto and the tenor are pretty much the same. It's those just those connective notes there to get up to the A. From the A up, it all works about the same. But on the berry, from the A up, you're down another half step. And therefore, what would have worked great for a B, on the tenor, I can play D with, or B with the D key here and play it up a sixth. Uh, that's going to be a B flat on the berry. And the C, um, so I'm fingering the E flat, I would get a C on alto or tenor, on berry, that's going to be a B. Everything slips, slips down a half step. So to get an A, instead of fingering it 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which doesn't work on the berry, it works great on alto and tenor. Uh, on, the, on the berry, I'm going to play it open. Like I'm overblowing that A. Would have been an A sharp on alto and tenor, it's an A on berry. However, I usually sit down the third finger, which changes that octave key thing. Uh, I like it actually with the other finger, two, other third finger, two, three and three. But, oh, you know what? I said it wrong uh, for the berry. Sorry, you can't do quite the same thing as the tenor. On, the, the, on that second flow, one, three, four, and then for G, one, three, six does kind of work, but it's a little bit choked on the G. It's better with one, three, four, five. No, not four, five, sorry. One, three, five. So... I can go one three four for F sharp, one three five for G. I can get G sharp by adding the, the side B flat to either one of those. I'm not the side B flat, the side C 
to either one of those. And then I can go to A, uh, just take off that first finger for A. I, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm playing G, one, three, let's stay here, one, three, six, one, three, five for G. And then I can take off finger number one, and that's going to give me a high A. That's good facility. That works really well. So I can go, I can go the palm keys to high E over for F sharp, swap over to one three four for G one three five, and then for A three and five. Works great. And the three and five just about the same as three and six for the A. I often use three and six for the A if I'm just nailing it, but uh, but for for uh, facility one three five to one three six works great for uh, sorry I didn't say that right this gets confusing to talk about it this way you need to see it in writing you need to see it in the book one three four for F sharp one three six sorry I'm not going to use six I'm going to use five one three five for G and then just take off one and it's three and five for the IA as I said a minute ago so and then from there up I'm going to go to the D key for B flat B looks like a high E when I'm playing uh, C. Looks like a high F when I'm playing C sharp. Looks like a high um, F sharp on the palm key fingerings, and I'm playing the high uh, D. So everything has shifted a half step on the berry. This is an un uh, it's, uh, it's hard to explain why this happens, but I really like the students if I can to see them to let them see it from the alto standpoint. Uh, and then they can see how we have to vary for the tenor and the berry on that first set, and then we have to vary again on the berry on the second set to go higher from the A up. Uh, that's probably about as clear as mud. Uh, talking about this stuff in the air is quite difficult, uh, but uh, it's all written out clearly in the book so that you can see all these options. Uh, I think it might be good if I could just uh, play a few examples uh, on these other instruments for you. Uh, let me put the tenor down. Uh, just using some of the altissimo. These are some things that I've recorded just recently. Uh, for example, uh, this is on the New York State of Mind on the Jack Wood album. It's a tenor solo that I recorded recently using quite a bit of altissimo. Using the fingerings that I've written out in the book for you. I left them all behind so we're just coming into the tenor solo here. I'm in a New York state of Uh, maybe I'll play a Barry solo that I did recently. It's used a bit of altism. I just recorded this a, a month or two back. And get it over to about where the. It's kind of a New Orleans second line thing. I think we're coming into the Barry solo right here. <laughs> kind of fun, short but fun. Um, and actually, let me just share with you something on soprano here. Let's see. How about Mozart? So this one has the. This is in the, this is the oboe quartet, which I did with on soprano saxophone with the violin, viola, and cello, and the. Uh, uh, it was in the key of F for the oboe, Kershaw 370, uh, and so that put the soprano in G, 
and I had to play some high G's. I have a high G key on my soprano, but I didn't use it uh, in the piece much. It seemed easier to use the altissimo fingering that I usually use, which is the same as the G on the alto. So let me skip over to where more altissimo is. There's a G. The G on the end here. <laughs> Got a bit treacherous one on the last note. In fact, that reminds me of another thing where the last note is a high G. It might be interesting to hear that. It's a really touchy place. Where is that? It's the Debussy uh, girl with the flaxen hair. Uh, my saxophone quartet, the Utah saxophone quartet, recorded this. And uh, Darren Bradford did the arrangement on it. is the uh, alto player in the group. Dave Feller from Weaver State on the tenor and my brother Galen on the berry. Let me just go to the end of it. And that's with the same G fingering as on the alto. One and one, side B flat. Uh, works great. And uh, the soprano works pretty much the same as the alto up there. Although I actually like that three and three high A on the soprano, like I use on the berry for whatever reason. But you can basically use the same fingerings on the soprano as the alto. Tenor drops that half step at the F sharp. So does berry. Berry drops another half step at the A. So that's kind of the, the uh, the sum of it in a nutshell, uh, I think that this is going to be a lot more effective, more powerful for you if you can look at all of this in writing and follow along with it and then try it on your instrument yourself. But I think that this makes some sense to see it in a, in a really concerted way uh, for these students who usually just get it in such a haphazard way. So thanks for watching. I hope that this is helpful.